The next speaker is Chris Oliver. Um, he is a professor of, of neurodevelopmental disorders and director of the Cerebra Center for Neurodevelopmental Disorders. His main research interests are behavioral, cognitive, and emotional disorders in people with severe intellectual disability, genetic syndromes, and autism spectrum conditions. It is especially interesting that his focus in research is within the areas of communication, behavior, and autism, areas that have a vital impact on the family's lives and also a guide the families in how to live and cope with life. Dr. Oliver has been in Norway several times, both lecturing here at Frambu and other conferences. We here at Frambu is happy that in the next years to come, he will have, we will form a more close This is uh, the way my colleagues usually shut me down. But I had another one. Uh, we, we will form a closer cooperation with Dr. Oliver, uh, since he has agreed to be a co-supervisor in Heidi Nog's PhD here at Frambu. So please welcome Professor Chris Oliver. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and um, it's an enormous pleasure to come back to Norway and um, a real honour, I think, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of, of Frambu. I'm a real admirer of the work that's done at Frambu because one of the things that they do so well is help us all understand what it is like to have a genetic disorder that leads to behavioural difference. And that's really behind the title. It's about... Um, us trying to see the world through someone else's eyes, someone who has a, a genetic disorder. And one of the phrases we can use is to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. And that's the theme of the talk. It, it's about how um, we experience, how we all, everyone in this room, experiences things differently. And people with genetic disorders, in a sense, are no different in that respect. They will experience things differently. And if we understand that, then we can often understand some of the behaviours that they show. We're, we're very familiar, I think, with, with knowing that our culture and our experience influence our behaviour significantly. Um, the foods that we would choose to eat, the foods that we prefer, um, our language, for example, these things influence, uh, are influenced by our culture and experience. Um, everyone in this room, when looking at this, there'll be a difference between people when you look at the same stimulus so what this means is there is an individual difference in experiencing a stimuli. Some of you will have immediately seen an elderly woman, a woman's face and some of you would have seen a younger woman with a hat and you can flip between these. But the point is, is that the same stimulus has a different experience for, for different people. We also know that our genes influence how we taste food and this is uh, particularly relevant to me and about 30 other people in the room. So there is a, a variant of a gene that makes broccoli taste particularly bitter and unpleasant. So some people in this room will, could eat the same piece of broccoli as some other people and you would have a very different experience and that influences your behaviour, just how quickly you run away from broccoli. And finally, at Frambu, the emphasis is on a much more significant genetic difference. For example, the deletion of a gene or a number of genes or duplication of a number of genes. But we can, we can um, carry that idea forward that these genes will give rise to experience in the world in a different way, and that gives rise to different behaviours. So one of the things that we know is that these genes, or genetic disorders, may give rise to a physical difference, for example, in Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And as you look at the photograph of the girl in the top right-hand corner, you can see how the genetic disorder has influenced um, her facial characteristics. 
And then this is one of my favorite pictures from the uh, Facebook page of Cornelia de Lange. And as you look around the pictures, you start to get the pattern. You start to see the similar facial characteristics. And then we know that the gene um, is influencing, or the genetic disorder is influencing the physical characteristics. And it influences other physical char characteristics that can then be associated with behavior. So just as a gene controls the development of the face, it also controls the development of the gastrointestinal system of the gut. And one of the problems in Cornelia de Lange is that this leads to significant reflux or the experience of acid coming up into the esophagus. And this, in turn, gives rise to middle ear infections, dental abnormalities, but it also is significantly associated with self-injurious behavior, one of the more troublesome behaviors that we see in people with Cornelia de Lange syndrome. So here you can see those showing self-injury are showing more reflux scores, higher scores on a reflux measure than those who are not. So this is a way in which a physical difference influences behavior. The second way is, um, a, a good example is in smith mcginnis syndrome. So in this syndrome, we see very significant sleep disturbance. And this comes around because melatonin, which is released at particular times of the, the night, helps us maintain our sleep. And up in the top right-hand corner, the um, orange line um, is people with smith mcginnis and the blue line is a typically developing group. And you can see here that in the blue line, uh, people are typically releasing melatonin around 10 o'clock through to around 4 in the morning. This is inverted in smith mcginnis syndrome with melatonin being released in the afternoon. This means that people are naturally very sleepy in the afternoon and not at night. Um, and this is an actigraph study. So we um, asked a child with smith mcginnis to wear this small watch. And we can see when they're awake. And it's when the, it's this period here from about 10 o'clock till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And that's very, very troublesome for that child and, and very troublesome for parents. But this is an example of where if someone is tired in the afternoon or irritable, it's not because they are willful and being naughty. It's because at that time, it's 4 o'clock in the morning for us. And so that physical difference gives rise to a very different behavioral profile. Another type of difference that we might think of is cognitive difference. So this is where particular cognitive functions um, have not developed in a typical way. So here in rubenstein tabe syndrome, we can look at one behavior in particular, repetitive questioning. And this can again be difficult for parents and carers and difficult for the person themselves. But people with rubenstein tabe syndrome will typically repeatedly ask the same question. And it may be that that's related to a cognitive difference. So we can test that with some highly sophisticated equipment, uh, a couple of puppets. And what you have to do is when the good bear says, do something, you do it. But if the naughty dragon, and I realize this is stereotyping dragons, but if the naughty dragon says something, you must not do it. The children with rubenstein tabe syndrome found this remarkably difficult. They can repeat the rule, and if we compare them to children of typical development, the same overall mental age, they still perform very, very poorly. In other words, they have a significant problem inhibiting a behavior. They cannot stop. Once the idea comes into their head, they cannot suppress that behavior. And what's interesting is that um, performance on that task and on their work in memory, very poor work in memory, that correlates with repetitive questioning. So when they're engaging in repetitive questioning, it's because the work in memory is poor, but also they cannot inhibit the need to ask that question. So whilst it feels perhaps irritating to be repeatedly asked the question, the children are not doing it to irritate or to, to annoy. It's something that is driven by specific cognitive impairments. So that's an important difference. Another difference is, is the experience of emotions. And this um, poster was drawn by a young woman with Prada-Willi syndrome. And what she's describing is happening to her is something very common in the syndrome, which is explosive outbursts of temper 
And you can see here how, how the, the change, and it's the way she describes it, this overcomes her, it overwhelms her, it's outside of her control. And when we interview parents of children, what's important is the bottom line here. So these are temper outbursts that have been running for an hour, two hours, sometimes just under 24 hours. But the last line, what happens afterwards, is the children and adults were intensely apologetic, very, very remorseful about what happened, and would often say, it just overcame me. And this alludes to a kind of um, a poor emotional control in that particular syndrome. You also see this kind of outburst in smith mcginnis syndrome. And this comes from a Facebook page. And again, you can see parents, a very, very accurate description of what happens during these um, temper outbursts. And they can last for long periods of time. And again, parents will say, it looks absolutely uncontrollable. And these typically happen if um, somebody is asked to wait for something or if they are unable to achieve the thing they want to do. And this causes a, a response in others, I think, of thinking that someone is simply impatient and simply won't wait for things when they should. But again, there might be different reasons <coughs> for this. So we have this flow of um, response initiation. So we, there's a stimulus, the person gets ready to respond, and then they're able to inhibit the response. And actually, in smith mcginnis syndrome, through running these experiments of inhibition, we found that actually the children were quite good on the bear dragon task. So for them, in contrast to the children with rubenstein Taby, they were able to inhibit when the dragon told them to do something and they shouldn't. But it was the consequences that was highly correlated with the temper outbursts. So it was emotional control that was the problem. So it wasn't, um, it, the issue was not about not carrying out an act that might be a very, very bad idea. It wasn't about suppressing that thought. It was much more about the emotion that people experienced when the thing that they um, wanted was, was not attainable. So that's an emotional difference that was very, very difficult for the children to control. The final difference I'll mention is um, a, a social difference. So um, this is where, uh, this is a, um, at our lab, and um, Ella has come to see us, and she's going to take part in an eye-tracking experiment. And when we do these experiments, we can see how people are processing social information. So we, when we meet someone, we take a lot of information from the face, and we take even more from the eyes. That's where we learn a great deal. It gives us a lot of feedback. And so when we do these experiments, we can look at where people are looking on a screen, and it allows us to see if they're um, processing the right amount of information or information from the right place. And at the bottom here, you can see this is where someone of typical development usually looks. You can see hot spots around the eyes. And this is where someone with an autism spectrum disorder often looks. So less attention to the eyes and more to points of detail uh, around the face. And these eye tracking experiments also allow us to see other differences. So when there's a flow of conversation or there's a social interaction, um, the yellow line shows people uh, of typical development and they're moving from one person to the other. But on the red, li uh, the red line shows people with autism and they're not looking at the same areas. So here, we were comparing Cornelia DeLange, rubenstein Toby, and Fragile X syndrome. And one of the things you can see is in the group with Fragile X syndrome that people are not looking in the eyes. Now, that may not be because of an autism spectrum disorder, but it's a strong characteristic in children with Fragile X to show gaze aversion, to look away from the eyes. So it's a very clear social difference, but it may have social consequences because then people are not taking in that social information that would otherwise be available to them. I want to contrast that to a social difference in another syndrome, which is uh, Angelman syndrome. So um, 
one of the significant characteristics of children with Angelman syndrome is the heightened sociability and frequent smiling. And I'm going to tie this now to the, to the eye contact. Um, and one of the things that uh, are very characteristic, and so when I look at my pictures of the children with Angelman syndrome, they are nearly always smiling. And if you look around the room now, you'll see something very important. Nearly everyone is smiling. And that smile is evocative. And this is emotion signaling, where the facial characteristics of someone else allow us to experience almost the same emotion that that person is experiencing. But the Angelman smile is special. And so if we, in a classroom, look at when the children smile, and then we look at what teachers do in response. So we have a group of children with intellectual disability matched to the children with Angelman syndrome. And then we say, when the children with intellectual disability smile, what effect does it have on the teacher's behavior? Well, a teacher will give attention for about 20 seconds, teacher smiles for about 20, and gives eye contact for 10. But the children with Angelman syndrome have got a super smile. So they attract attention for 50 seconds, the teacher smiles for around 50 seconds, and there's eye contact for about 30 seconds. So this social behavior is very evocative. It's an industrial strength smile that evokes a real difference from people around them. And then what you see in a socially competitive environment is the children with Angelman syndrome draw people in. And the, the research workers, uh, our PhD students and postdocs who go out and visit the children, come back and they say they have aching around their face. And it's caused by the constant smiling. But here's the point. What the children often do is seek out eye contact. So you can see this young girl is dipping slightly lower so she can gain eye contact. And when we've looked at sequences of behavior, what then happens, as soon as eye contact is gained, then the smile appears. So contrast those two people. A child with fragile X syndrome who finds gaze difficult and avoids gaze and a child with Angelman syndrome who seeks out gaze because it's a pleasurable experience. That's a social difference that affects their quality of life on a day-to-day -day basis. It influences their environment, and then their environment will respond to that behavior. So I've shown you some examples of um, individual behaviors in individual syndromes. And one of the things that Frambu does incredibly well is recognize complexity. So when you, as a clinician, you are not just dealing with these behaviors in isolation. So in smith mcginnis syndrome, for example, you are not just dealing with the temper outbursts and the very significant self-injury. You are doing this against a background of a sleep disorder which disrupts the sleep of the parents as well. And don't forget, those emotional outbursts can occur at 4 o'clock in the morning. So you have very, very tired parents trying to deal with these behaviors on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is critical to the way we research these and the way we respond as clinicians, is the whole behavioral context, um, the, the, the interaction between these individual behaviors, and also the impact of that on the family when we're trying to run interventions. And that's what I want to just mention now is in some of our studies, we've started to look at how we're able to support families with these behaviors, but knowing that this is pretty difficult, that there are high levels of stress, people are multitasking and trying to cope with these behaviors against regular day-to-day -day life. And these are some of our results. I just want to show you here, um, by way of contrast, very well documented, very high levels of anxiety in mothers of children with autism. And these are two other syndromes. And then I'll just add the Angelman syndrome group. And there you can see extremely high levels of stress in parents. The same is also true in smith mcginnis syndrome. What's interesting about those two syndromes is sleep disorders are very prominent. And in regression models, 
and parceling out the effects of other behaviours, it keeps coming back to sleep. And I think this shows us that sleep disorders are perhaps a priority for us in terms of research and maybe clinical priority as well. So I'm going to um, just draw some conclusions now. I, I, I learned very early on when I was speaking at conferences, never get between an audience and lunch. <laughs> and uh, just, a, so just a, a few closing thoughts. I think, I hope I've shown you the importance of etiology. People working at Frambu know that. But there is still an argument to be won amongst um, the wider intellectual disability services where there is still a view that at times etiology is completely unimportant. And there are some times when that's true. But actually, of all of the variables that we have to explain behavior, etiology explains more of the variance than any other variable. So this is, um, I think, very important to recognize uh, etiology. Um, inclusion and difference. Um, when one is making the argument about people who have genetic disorders, it's almost inevitable that we are emphasizing the ways in which people are different from other people. And that sometimes feels uncomfortable. It feels counter to inclusion. But I think there's an argument that unless we know the nature of difference, we cannot adapt the environment to be more inclusive. The background to this slide, I think, is a wonderful bit of architecture. So it's steps leading up, as you can see. But you can see here that there is wheelchair access provided, but the subtlety of the architecture allows that blending, and that's a good example of, of subtle inclusion, of carefully thought through inclusion. But it comes about knowing what difference that architectural environment needs to cater for. Because when we can pin that down, so we can do that more carefully. The rare but not uncommon argument, I think, has been made before. So each of these individual genetic disorders are very rare and individually are numerically small. But having a genetic disorder and some of these behavioral difficulties, that isn't uncommon the overall number of people in the UK will be about half a million people, for example. So that's a sizable um, number of people. And this is where collaboration becomes important. And I am delighted to be um, collaborating with Heidi Nag. Um, and two weekends ago in the UK, we, I attended the smith McGuinness Syndrome meeting. And at that meeting, this is Sarah Elsie from the USA. This is Lucy Wilde in our team. Um, other people, I, I apologize for not knowing their names, but other people were the smith McGuinness Syndrome family groups from Sweden, um, Finland, Iceland, uh, the Netherlands, and I think Norway. But the most important thing here is that we, if we come together and start to collaborate on research and then information sharing, then there's real mutual benefit. And tomorrow afternoon, I'll go to Sweden to meet with the Swedish group, and we'll begin to start the ball rolling in this kind of collaboration. Just in the corridor, as you, as you go down to lunch, you'll see on the wall the leaflets produced by Frambu. And these are incredibly important to parents. We should never underestimate the importance of information. We've transferred a lot of our research onto this website, the FIND website, and we update this covering new syndromes. Parents are speaking about their experience. Professionals give two or three minute summaries about genetics, behavior. And there are, for example, um, videos of children who may be, for example, experiencing pain and showing self-injury. Because the more you see different videos, the more you get the pattern of what pain behavior looks like in a child who cannot communicate verbally. And that's very, very important. Um, I'll just finish on a, a plea. One of the important things, I think, and again, something that I think Frambu does very well, is to start to build the case and build the network for early intervention. We're now much further ahead in knowing the difficulties that people will experience in their lives and the times at which they will experience these. Interventions are starting to be developed or are already there if we know which children need which intervention. For example, in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, 
a miprazole for the reflux or a fundoplication operation can correct the reflux and we're seeing less and less self-injurious behavior. But we need to think about ways of um, helping parents manage proactively the temper outbursts, but also in syndromes like rubenstein taby could we teach children using computer games to be able to inhibit behaviors? Can we enhance working memory as we have done similarly with computer games in people with Down syndrome? These things are possible. So some of it is about adapting the environments, but some of it is also helping people overcome those specific impairments. So that's the, the, the plea for early intervention. It's 12.30, never get between people and their lunch. Um, I think I'll be amongst probably 30 people who, who'll be hoping that there's a choice of vegetables for lunch, <laughs> but also um, knowing, knowing how sensitive Framu is to genetic difference, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a great lunch. Now, thank you for your time. These are my team. This is my team back in the UK, a very committed team of very talented and very hardworking uh, young people who will be working pretty hard now in Birmingham so that I get to come to Norway. It doesn't get any better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Chris. Here are your Thank flowers. You Thank you. And uh, Thank you. I'm sure that lunch will be, uh, or to, to meet your expectations, hopefully. Uh, and also, again, this is a taste for your longer le lecture tomorrow. Looking yep. forward to that. Thank you so much.